What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot. Today, we're looking at Isaiah 34, 35, and 36 in the Old Testament. And then we're looking at Philippians 2 in the New Testament. But here in Isaiah 34, we're reminded of the movement of Isaiah. We've seen so much about judgment. Chapter 34 really wraps up that idea. Judgment on the nations. What is God going to do for these evil, wicked nations? Well, it says that God is enraged against the nations. He's furious. Like, have you ever thought of God as being furious? That's what it says he is. He's furious at the nations. He's so angry. He says he's going to have the, he's going to come down and the sky is going to be rolled back like a scroll, which you might know that uh, from some famous hymns um, that we sing in the, the, the church age about um, Jesus coming back. But really that idea, the, the sky being rolled back as a scroll is the idea that God's going to come and judge these nations. And he's going to do it because he's going to take revenge on the people who oppressed Zion. Now, a lot of the judgment that's being described in this book is about judgment coming to Mount Zion. It's about judgment that's coming to Jerusalem. So how come he's getting mad at the people who are judging Jerusalem? Because isn't God wanting to judge Jerusalem too? Well, yes, but he's so angry that they have abused this city. They have messed up the people in it. That is evil in and of itself. And he's mad at, at what they've done. And it says he's going to come and take revenge. He says there's um, they all, even all the nobles and all the, the wealthy people, they are going to be um, taken out too. He says all the nice places that were super nice, they're going to be overgrown, abandoned with thorns and thistles. And it's going to be a place for jackals and ostriches and hyenas and all that stuff. And it says in verse 16, seek and read it from the book of the Lord. So I think it's a helpful reminder. He says, hey, just remember, God promised this. Go, go check it out. If you don't believe this is going to happen, read it. It's the same thing that we should be reminded. Hey, we don't think this is going to happen. Well, just read it. If you're tempted to think, well, I don't know if God's really going to take out big, powerful kingdoms. Well, he wouldn't take out our country, would would he, for, for being unrighteous? He wouldn't, he wouldn't do that, would he? Well, read it. It says he will. It says he'll take out all these nations that oppose him. He will be the one who destroys every nation that sets himself up against the Lord. He'll take them out. Well, verse 35, chapter 35. What do we make of this now? Well, it says the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like, like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. There's going to be water in the wilderness. Why? Because everyone's going to see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. It says, uh, in verse 3, strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of your God. He shall come and save you. Then it says the, the eyes of the blind will be opened. The, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame man will leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will sing for joy. What is going on? People are getting healed miraculously. Like What is that talking about? Well, again, the ministry of Jesus starts that age. You start to see, well, you see these people, they're being free. I think when Jesus did the miracles that he did in the New Testament era, what he was doing is previewing what the kingdom would be like. He was showing them this is what it's going to be like at the end. I'm filling the words of Isaiah of, of making these blind people be able to see. Well, what happens next? Verse 8, a highway shall be there. And it shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over it. It says only these righteous people that are going to the new Jerusalem, only they are going to pass through this. And it says, in this city, the ransomed of the Lord shall return. And the, they will come to Mount Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. Think about that. Everlasting joy forever, for eternity. What is that talking about? Well, it's talking about the new world, where he's going to make everything right. Where every sinful thing is going to be removed. Where everything that is evil and bad about this world will be taken away, and it will be righteous in the end. Now, that reaches the end of a portion of this book of Isaiah, that is the oracles about the nations, the oracles about judgment and salvation. In chapter 36, we see a new thing that's brought up, and it's helpful that we get this today. You might think, well, wouldn't it be good to like end the last section and start the new section tomorrow? No, because what you're going to see is the connection between the two. Chapter 36 is talking about the historical situation of Isaiah, and basically what you're going to see in chapter 36 is, hey, are, is anyone going to trust the words of God? All of this stuff that we've just read is stuff that they heard. All the oracles of God, they heard this. They knew this, but what are they going to do about it? Are they going to take the oracles of God and say, I trust those. I'm going to put my faith in the Lord, and no matter what happens, I'm going to trust God. Or are they going to trust foreign nations? That's the question. They're put to the test. 
In chapter 36, King Sennacherib of the Assyrians comes and starts to take people out. So we can actually historically date this pretty well. This is probably in about 701 BC. So right around the year 700 BC, this Assyrian king comes and sweeps through that area and he's taking these people out. He sends this messenger called the Rabshakeh and he says to Hezekiah all these things. He says, hey, is anyone going to stop King Sennacherib? Guess what? No one's going to stop King Sennacherib. He is going to take over. But guess what? If you people, you Israelites, you Judeans, if you're trusting the Lord, well, then Sennacherib's going to destroy the Lord. You cannot stand in Sennacherib's way. Assyria will advance. If you join him and you surrender, maybe he'll give you your life. But if you don't, he'll take you out. That's the, the option presented to the Israelites. They take it um, and they listen to it. And they even take it to Hezekiah. And even the people are like, hey, uh, hey, Rabshakeh, you don't have to talk in the language of the people. And then the Rabshakeh says, you know why I'm talking in your language? Because I want everyone to know that God is not good enough, that God won't save you, that king of the king Sennacherib of Syria is going to kill you if you don't surrender him. What are you going to do? That's the question. What are they going to do? Hezekiah says he's going to trust God. And we're going to see tomorrow how he turns to God. But the good news is Hezekiah and these Judeans are saying, nope, we're not listening to you. Even if you come at us with an army that's strong, even if you are the ones who have more numbers, we are not going to trust you. We're not going to surrender to you. We are going to trust the Lord. That's what they do. And you're going to see how that's paying off tomorrow. But I want you to see the connection between prophecy and history. What's the connection? All the prophecy, all the stuff we read about was connecting. It's, it's for real life. You might think, well, it's promising about the future and talking about the new world. How does that have to do with now? Well, it has to do with now because we need to trust the Lord now. Whatever situation we're in, we need to trust the Lord now. So that's what Hezekiah does, and we're going to see how that pays off for him. So that's our Old Testament reading. Today in the book of Philippians, we're looking at the call for Christians to be united, to be selfless instead of selfish. And the reason for that, the basis for that is Jesus. Paul says, look to Jesus. He's the one who set aside his preferences. He's the one who came and lived in our place, who died on the cross for us, who rose again, and who is seated at the right hand of God with all the power and all the authority of God. He is the one that we should be following in his example. In his earthly ministry, he put others first. He humbled himself by becoming the obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And that's what he says we should be like too for other people. We should be willing to be humble and submissive and putting others before ourselves and creating unity in our selflessness. Not unity around other things, but unity around being like Christ. And then it says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only my absence, but not only my presence, but much more my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is going to allow you to live righteously. Verse 14 says, hey, one righteous thing that you should do is stop complaining. Some, be someone who instead of complaining, you're giving God thanks. You're glorifying God. That'll make you stand out for everybody. Then he says, hey, there's two guys I want you to know about. Timothy and Epaphroditus. Both of them are good examples. They're examples like Christ, which is why some people look at Philippians 2 and say, well, how could I ever live like Christ? I mean, he was so humble. He set his life aside, but I could never be like that. Well, Philippians 2 gives two other men who did that. It gives Epaphroditus and Timothy, who both cared more about the Philippians than they cared about their own lives. And Paul says, look to them. They're good examples. Be like them. Respect them. Give them honor. It's a helpful reminder for us. We should respect and give honor to the people in our lives who sacrifice for others. But even more than that, do that. But also, on top of that, be a person who's replicating that in your life. Be like Christ. Be selfless. See how I can put, how can I put someone's needs before my own today? Do that. And guess what? You're living like Christ when you do that. So thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot.